And hello once more, ladies and gentlemen, boys and girls. Welcome to episode 62 of A Druid's Dozen. Yep, my name's John. I'm known in certain circles as the Rock Druid. And basically, these videos are just me once a week going through my record collection, um, which is quite substantial, dragging out a dozen albums, uh, six on CD, six on vinyl, and chatting about them for a bit. I've been a radio DJ for many years. I've currently got two shows. There's the uh, Sunday Rock Show on BCFM Radio 93.2 in Bristol in the UK. And then there's uh, the uh, Rock Druid Show on Astro Radio Earth. Links to both shows and where you can listen are going to be down there on YouTube, over there on Facebook. Do the finger dance. My missus complains if I don't do the finger dance, you know. Anyway, um, yeah, I've been collecting records for years, and uh, actually I started DJing because I had loads of music, so, um, uh, yeah, I've just dragged out a dozen for you, and we're going to have a look at them. So, we'll start vinyl as always. I shall put on my bins and drag out the first suspect for today. There we go. A bit of new over British heavy metal for you. This is Angel Witch Live by Angel Witch, of course. And I think this is about 1990. I'll double check on the, in on the inner sleeve in a minute. There's the front, anyway. There is the back. Whip this out. There's this particular incarnation of Angel Witch. There's the sleeve. I just noticed there. That's an obscure band for you. Anyone else remember Chariot? I think they only did a couple of cassette only albums, but yeah. Anyway, whip this out. Um, Nineteen ninety. Yeah, that's right. Metal Blade Records and uh, no run out groove messages, just catalog numbers. Angel, which of course, um, one of the very first and the pioneers of the whole new over British heavy metal movement. Um, came sort of like 1980, 79, 80, their de eponymous debut album. Had a minor hit single with uh, Sweet Danger. Um, a load of classic tracks like White Witch, Flight 19, etc. Uh, did a string of albums, which were all quite impressive throughout the early 80s, and then kind of uh, still going to this day um periodically did an album a couple of years ago which was I can't remember the name of it but that was quite cool i've got it digitally but anyway um this is a live album they brought out 19 say 1990 um the only surviving member of the band uh, original lineup on here is kevin havel uh the guitarist and lead vocalist um previous members include someone dufont who was the um brother of girl schools denise dufont but anyway i digress um so this came out and uh yeah it's okay um it's a very rough around the edges recording um done sort of like basically raw from uh well, is it somewhere in the states it was recorded yeah the troubadour los angeles um yeah um it's a very rough around the edges. The production is uh, a little bit nah. But, you know, this is you have a British heavy metal. I mean, the number of times I've been in clubs like the old Granary in Bristol or Boogies in Cardiff, watching these type of bands. And to be honest with you, getting a perfect mix isn't really the point. It's just about making noise and having fun. And that's what these guys are doing. Um, this is basically uh, blasting through most of the tracks here off their first album, uh, that their eponymous debut, uh, which is, a, as I said, a bit of an all-time classic. Um, you've got cuts like uh, Sweet Danger, Flight 19, White Witch, Angel Witch, um, Baphomet, 
uh, Angel of Death, Extermination Day, Atlantis. It comes at you like, well, a load of metal coming straight at you. It's raw, it's in your face, it's up-tempo, it's heavy, it's just fun. Um, as I say, it's a, production's a little bit loose around the edges and, uh, you know, maybe one day someone will find this and give it a tweak and a remix, but um, it's not that essential. Um, I wouldn't recommend that people start with this album um, to get into Angel Witch. Uh, you know, I would recommend, you know, go with their first studio album and albums like Screaming and Bleeding, but uh, still... It's pretty sweet, and it's Angel Witch. What more do you want? Yeah, Angel Witch Live, 1990, our first suspects of the day. Okay, moving on, we're going to go down under. Well, there's a story behind this one. This is Raise the People by Court by Aussie Band Calling All Cars. There's the front, and you can see it's been autographed. There is the back. All right, pop this open. Nothing behind the disc because this just says there, they're promotional use only, not for resale. And I'll never sell my promos, you know. Well, I have people ask you, get offering me silly money for some of them, but no, nah, they're mine. They stay in my collection. Open this up. There's a better view of the cover. There's the uh, back of the booklet. There's the band themselves. And then in here, you just got lyrics. There we are, lyrics there. Right, now, <clears throat> calling all cars, band are still very much an ongoing concern. Um, but one of these bands, they became really big in Australia. We're talking about headlining major festivals, we're talking... Um, you know, special guests of bands like the Foo Fighters playing massive stadiums. We're talking chart albums. We're talking hit singles. However, outside Australia, they were a little un little known cult band. They decided to try and refix that around when this album came out in uh, 2014 by relocating to the UK for about 18 months. And um, first of all, relocated to London recorded this at City Sound Studio in London, but then the guys were beginning to find that living in London was a bit bleep and expensive. So they relocated here to Bristol. And um, I can't remember exactly how our paths crossed, but they did. And uh, well, I ended up getting to know the guys. And um, they, came on the sh they came on the radio show at BCFM. Um, I went to see them live playing some local gigs in Bristol and uh, you know they were really nice guys and you know they were saying they, they were finding it weird that they were um, you know they yeah you know, two years previous they had been opening up for the Foo Fighters in massive stadiums all over Australia and New Zealand and now they're playing at venues like the Fleece of Perkin in Bristol you know sort of like 500 capacity sweaty pubs um, and to be honest with you, they did say they were loving it, their whole back to the roots thing. Their English adventure didn't last long. They relocated back to Australia within a year or so. But, you know, they made a bit of an impact on the Bristol scene because, um, you know, all of a sudden, local bands suddenly found themselves working alongside some really experienced musicians that were playing the same venues as they were. You know, consummate professionals that were could really help encourage a local scene and they did a you know with bands like cars on fire and a few others owe a lot to uh, calling all cars is so june in bristol anyway this album raise the people is pretty sweet it's got that kind of um 
oh, I don't know, Foo Fighters, Static X, um, System of a Down vibe to it, um, you know, Stained maybe, all those kind of bands. It's kind of that, he, you know, where heavy rock and heavy metal meets the alternative scene, that kind of blurred um, boundary. And, uh, you yeah, know, there isn't a bad track on this album, to be honest with you. Uh, my favourite cut has to be the fourth track, Werewolves. Um, but, you know, from the opener, Raise the People, to the close of Looking Through Your Window, everything is really sweet. Um, you've got uh, uh, Hayden Ng and uh, his brother James on the vocals and guitar. And uh, Adam Montgomery and... Um, for some reason, Adam hasn't signed this, but the Ying brothers have. Um, oh, that's right, because when I when I got this off them, he had gone back to Australia for a week or two to visit family because I was taking some time out. But anyway, um, a great album. I've got this is the only one I've got a physical copy of. I do uh, possess a couple of their other albums on digital, and I said the band's still a very much an ongoing concern. And I think I was reading. Um, I don't know, my brain's just gone dead, but I was thinking they reading that these guys have got a uh, a new album in the pipeline, so uh, look out for that. But yeah, I salute all of my friends from Down Under, and uh, salute Calling All Cars. Great band that should be worth everybody's checking out. And this album's a damn good place to start. Calling All Cars, Raise the People, 2014. Okay. <coughs> the next one is a bit of a uh, gem a bit of a rare gem a bit of a collector's item a bit of a classic and um yeah it's just one of those albums there's so much to say about this i'm going to try and keep it sweet anyway there is the front cover this is from 1971 and it's space hymns by a band called ramesses but there is the front now I'm not going to show you the back. What I am going to do is, if I can work out, remember how this goes. It goes like that. I'll take them out for a minute. Then it goes like that. I'm going to try and get all this on the camera. Can you see that? This is the biggest album cover Roger Dean ever did. I'll hold this up for a little while while I chat behind it so you can uh, get the gist. Okay, and then if I flip him over, you've got that. Yeah, and I'll just turn it back to the front again. Apparently, the cover is the spire of St. Stephen's Church in Manchester being fired into space like a great rocket. Now, and I'll just show you this as well. This is the disc. Sadly, this isn't the Vertigo original first first pressing Vertigo swirl. This is a probably slightly later pressing from around about probably around about 72. And it's got the Vertigo Dean cover, Dean label there. And there's nothing on the run out grooves part from the catalogue number. Right, I'll put this back in carefully because I have discovered that this is a very rare collectible album. I've had this sitting in my racks for a, for a fair while. Not really, so I can't even remember where I got my hands on it, but it's not really realizing what I had. Um, <coughs> It was in a box that's not in the main collection. It was in a box of stuff to be sorted and checked and played. Well, I was having a look through that box the other day, found this, gave it a check, and it's 
in really good nick the record is the sleeves are a bit dog-eared in places but you know um overall the the vinyl's fine and uh whoever had it before printed out a load of notes right now um there was a bloke and i can't remember his name because it's not actually on here um <clears throat> martin somebody or another i think the guy's name was lived in yorkshire up in the uk and was a uh gas fitter had a pretty ordinary life born in the mid 1930s missed world war ii because he was too young did his national service with the royal air force for a couple of years demobbed took up gas fitting or central heating uh, maintenance or something like that by the 1960s he was hanging out with a load of yorkshire hippies and then one day he vanished him and his wife who i think was the name of someone like shirley um i may be wrong correct me in the in the notes if, if i am vanished off the face of the earth about eight months later they arrived in manchester dressed in uh, flowing silk robes calling themselves ramesses and septet claiming to be the uh, descendants or reincarnations of egyptian pharaohs and his queen um apparently the egyptian gods have visited them and uh told them who they were and uh say and told them they were on a mission to bring peace to the world through music as far as i'm aware neither ramesses or septet martin or shirley had actually played anything before then but they sat down and started writing some music with a few friends now the intro one of the interesting thing is amongst the friends they started writing music with was um uh, lowell creme and kevin godley later to go find fame with 10 cc um and a load of other kind of manchester session musicians like ed stewart and that that eventually came on to, um you know find fame in their own right anyway after a couple of singles that did absolutely naffle they sat down and recorded this album and man if you want to kind of have the archetypal hippie psychedelic album this is the one you've got to go for this you cannot get any more hip psychedelic hippie than this this is um not exactly prog rock um it's got elements of sort of like folk rock kind of like airport convention with added acid needless to say it was those kind of uh you know that stuff they're warning you about about don't touch the brown acid at Oz, uh, um, woodstock i think these guys might have actually touched the brown acid um i know there were hallucinogens involved but anyway um what they produced with this album is a quite an incredible piece of work it's trippy it's folky it's very naive in places it's all kind of all the lyrics of songs like um you got things like was it earth people um i've got to fold some of this out again so i can see the track listing uh, oh, i can just pop this out bear with me a second Problem is with these massive gatefold sleeves. I've got a hawking one that's the same. You can never get them to go back right. Anyway, um, you've got uh, cuts like um, let's have a look, uh, Life Child, and the Whole World, Quasar One, Jesus Come Back, Journey to the Inside, Earth People, Dying Swan Year. <coughs> there very much away with the fairies um very much kind of uh drifty trippy stuff makes great um uh 
music for listening to around about 4.20 in the afternoon if you get my drift, my American cousins. And, yeah, it should just sweet. Um, it's naive. It didn't really achieve much in the charts, um, you know, which is one of the reasons why this is rare. Now, a mint, um, I was checking up on the various collector's sites and that, a mint version of this, of the first pressing with the Vertigo Swirl label, well, put it this way, you might need a second mortgage to get your hands on a copy there. Um, you know, four or five hundred pound plus. Even something like this is going to be into three figures with the kind of condition it's in and being on a second pressing. Very rare, although it's available on CD for 15 quid. So, uh, you know, you don't have, unless you're a massive rabid vinyl fan, get the CD. But anyway, um, the album is sweet. It's curious. It's got some interesting session musicians on here. And it's very listenable in a kind of hippie laid back, chilled out, uh, one world folk child way. So, um, yeah, 1971, uh, Space Hymns by Ramesses. And they did a, a follow-up album, came out about 1974, I think it was. But um, the record company tried to make it a bit more commercial, writing a string section and uh, doing a heavy remix. And uh, at this point, the gods of Egypt said, no, nah, we're not into that. If, if the man is messing with our music, we're not going to make music. And they vanished off the scene. Never to be seen again. So anyway, yeah, 1971, Space Hymns by Ramesses. It's just an incredible album with a great story behind it. Okay, that took me a bit longer to talk about than I thought, so I'll try and speed up a bit for the next one. We're going to keep it in the kind of hippie prog vein, but bring it a bit more up to date with this. This is uh, The World is a Game by Mishkari. And this is 2012. There is the front. Open it up. There's the gatefold. There's the disc. And there's a booklet in here somewhere. Here we go. Yeah, booklet, nice big centerfold kind of uh, it picture there. Um, it's kind of nice artwork, lyrics. Credits, etc. Now, Mystery are a Canadian band. Um, don't know that much about them. I know they were formed sort of like mid-1990s. Got about four or five albums out overall, of which this is the only one I possess. You know, one of these bands that I got one album, thought, that's quite good. I'll get some more. Never got around to doing it. Maybe I'll change that at some point. And as far as prog rock goes, it's pretty sweet. Um, it's also quite generic. Um... These guys are very much yes worshippers. Um, there's lots of kind of uh, yes you like. Um, oh, didn't realise it was signed. Don't know when I got that. I've never seen them live, so I don't know where I've got that done. Um, yeah, uh, was it vocalist uh, Ben O David? I think he actually played with yes, sang with yes for a bit. Um, and, you know, uh, the other guys, there's uh, Michael St. Pierre um, on uh, guitars, basses, is a guy called Anton Fatard, uh, Nick, Nick Valigio on drums, and a guy called, uh, oh, a lady called Mary, Marilyn uh, Provençal uh, Le Touc on the flute. Yeah, French Canadians. Um, that is pretty good. Um, but also, on the other hand, it can be a bit. Yes, you like. Um, and I'm not known as being the world's biggest Yes fan. Although you, I may actually surprise a couple of people with what's coming up later in this show. But, um, yeah, I'm not the world's biggest Yes fan. But, you know, I can tolerate Yes and I can tolerate this. 
uh, there's some pretty sweet tracks on here. Um, the ending track is 19 minutes long, called Another Day. And I do tend to find that drags a bit. You know, it's widdly pompous instrumentals for the sake of widdly pompous instrumentals. Very well played, lads, but you made your point. Move on. And uh, there's a slightly shorter epic of Pride, second track up, 11 minutes, which is, again, begins to test the old ears at the end. The rest of the stuff falls down to within kind of, uh, you know, as far as six minute, seven minute thing. And they're quite sweet with them. Highlight is probably the title track or the unwinding of time. Um, sorry, not the unwinding of time, dear someone. But uh, yeah, overall, I will say for hardcore prog rockers only, um, you know, your casual prog rock fan might find this a little bit up its own backside, maybe. But if you're used to a bit of prog, then, yeah, why not? Give it a go. Mystery. Uh, the World is a Game, 2012. Okay, next up, we'll have a real classic. Here we go. Setting Suns by the Jam, 1979. There is the front. There is the back. Open this up. Um, there's the lyric side with the uh, iconic Brighton Beach there with a bulldog and a Union Jack, you know. Lots of mod references there. Um, there's the... Uh, other side there. Whip this out. We've got two interesting uh, covers. There's that one there. Just uh, sorry, labels, and that one there. And No, they're just catalogue numbers. So, yeah, nothing on the run-out grooves. <coughs> now, um, The Jam, a band that I've loved since the mid, since the late 1970s. <coughs> um, sort of like the more intelligent face of UK punk. You're not saying that UK punk wasn't intelligent. I mean, you live... You know, if you meet, you know, sort of members of some of the bands that were back then, they were some, they were some sharp cookies. Um, but the Jam were probably one of the most intelligent. Paul Weller, a very, very good musician and an excellent songwriter, backed up with uh, was it Foxton and I can't remember who the drummer was. Um, I don't say. But anyway, um. Uh, just great band string of classic albums of which this is the fourth the fourth and penultimate jam album <coughs> and if I have to choose a jam album I'll choose this one as my favourite every uh, any day I mean this one sees the jam reach a maturity that you know the early albums are in the city and all that lot they're fine. They're great albums. They're really good. I really enjoy them. I've got them all and I play them regularly. But this is the one that I love. Um, started out as a concept album about three brothers that were, you know, kind of got separated during the First World War and how they reunited and found themselves kind of in sort of like going in different directions, both mentally and physically and emotionally. Um, concept work was abandoned for reasons probably known only to Paul Weller and the record company and the album was finished off just as a general jam album um, although you can if you when you play the album through you listen to tracks like Private Hell Little Boy Soldier um, Saturday's Kids The Eaton Rifles which was the big hit off here um, you can see that you know there's the the ghost of the concept story still 
present, although unfinished, not connected. Um, just a great piece of music uh, produced by the band themselves. Um, it's a lot darker, it's a lot heavier, a lot more intense than some of their other studio albums. And, um, you know, Oh, to me, this was the jam's high point. I mean, the album after this was the one where they started bringing in horn sections and that, and that led to the breakup of the jam. And you know, oh god, don't get me going about Spear of Destiny. Not Spear of Destiny, what was the band? Yeah, it was Spear, was it Spear of Destiny? Paul Weller's post jam band, um, the soul band, yeah, never liked them, but anyway, um, this is brilliant. Uh, my favorite cut on here has to be Little Boy Soldiers, although you know. You're picking the, you're trying to pick one out of a cream of, you know, sort of 10 excellent tracks. So um, if you've not really sat down and listened to a jam album before, because they are a band primarily known for, for their singles, but if you ever want to sit down and listen to a jam album in total, this is the one to start with. This is absolutely beeping brilliant. Okay, next up, I'm going to have to speed up a bit because rambling on about the Ramesses has slowed me down a bit. I normally allow around about an hour, give or take a minute each way for these, and I'm overrunning, so... Uh, I should put that there. Next up, we'll have this. From 2009, this is Mirrors and Smoke by the Silver Tongues. There's the front. There is the back. Pop this open. There is the disc. And it's not a booklet as such, it's just a just a folded sheet here. Like the artwork on there, it's got a kind of very naive uh kind of style to it that's um I don't know. But I just really think you think it works really well. So whoever did the artwork, and let's have a look. Did it say on here? Uh, no, it doesn't. Oh, yeah. Cover and design by Wax Ethic. So well done, Wax Ethic. Great, great artwork. And just a very basic info sheet. Yeah, came out September 1979, and uh, we can stream it. Now, the band, as far as I'm aware, are still going. They came out of Nottingham, um, uh, early, late 1990s, early 2000s, and they released a string of albums, of which this is one. Where it fits into in the canon, I don't know. Um, but... Uh, I know I've got an, got another EP by these guys, but beyond that, you know, I don't really know that much of their catalogue in depth. But I do know this is pretty sweet. Um, like I said, came out in 2009, just picked up heavy, heavy air. I wasn't doing the Rock Druid at the time, but it picked up heavy airplay on the BCFM. And... Um, yeah, I still it's still an album I'll drag out and play for listening pleasure if I get a chance, you know, to this day. Um, it's kind of, it's heavy rock, but with a kind of soulful kind of underpinnings to it. Um, so the band came out of Nottingham, and, um, you know, this album's pretty good. Play, run time about 46 minutes. Uh, Favourite cut on here has to be Minotaur. Has to be Minotaur. Although... Death on the Rocks, X-Ray, Black Hole, yeah, Entertainment for Men. All really good stuff. Excellently played. Um, there's a guy called John... Uh, I'll give you the line-up. Uh, John Spicer on uh, vocals. David Pierce on guitar. Johnny Briggs on uh, keyboards. Uh, Ken Doherty on... Uh, sorry, Ben Doherty on drums. And Tazio Foster on... Sorry. Ben Doherty's on bass, Sajjo Foster's on drums. Um, all of which do pretty good performances. Um, yeah, there's one of these bands that yeah, every city's got kind of local heroes. Uh, should be better known outside this city, but probably aren't. 
these guys are probably gods in Nottingham. Um, they should be they should be well known across the country, but uh, yeah. As long as I keep as long as I keep going, having fun and doing that and bringing out albums like this, then uh, more power to them. Yeah, um, well worth a check out if you get a chance. The Silver Tongues, Mirrors and Smoke. I say I have heard a couple of other bits and pieces by these guys, and they're still keeping up the quality. Band is still going, so uh, look out for them. Now lockdown's over. Look out for them in a venue near you at some point soon. Yeah, not uh, two thousand and nine. Mirrors and Smoke by the Silver Tongues. Okay, next up, have another CD. And this is, uh, we'll go to the US for this one. This is Circles by No Bragging Rights. There is the front. There is the back. I'll show you the press release in a minute. Pop this out. That's what lays behind the disc. There is the disc. Again, pull this out. Um, there's the back of the booklet. Or fold out. lyrics and finally I know some people like to see these when I've got them so uh, you can pause and read should you want to there's the uh, first part of the press release there's the second part Now, no bragging rights, kind of melodic hardcore, post-hardcore, a um, little bit post-punk. Anyway, they're out of Southern California. This is their third or fourth album. These guys make a lot of noise, and they're very good with it. Simple as that. Um, absolutely storming band. Um, if you're in a kind of uh, oh, I'm trying to think some of the later Converge some of AFI's stuff this is going to be right up your street if you've not come across these before um, don't know a vast amount about them just that they're rather good uh, this album I said 2013 uh, highlights of this include well probably my favourite car on here is probably uh not my salvation um quite a dark intense number uh then you got things like the ascensions hope theory uh appraisals and admission and missions um but you know every track's pretty sweet it's not the greatest album on earth um you know but on the other hand i've heard a hell of a lot worse uh it's well played it's the production maybe a little bit too much maybe a bit over polished in places yeah it could do with rougher roughening up i do like me kind of punky stuff a little heavy metal and that a little bit on the rough side rather than overly polished but that's just a personal taste thing i'm not going to take anything away from the performances on this album and uh yeah it's pretty good so not much else to say about this 2013 um no bragging rights and circles sorry cycles can't even read them i don't need to i need me these are my spare glasses i need me better ones but i left them in the kitchen never mind anyway um yeah give it a check out the band is still going and uh, this album's still available so give it a look okay next up a bit more prog. You've got a bit of a prog kind of, uh, prog rock kind, kind of vein running through this week's show. This is Danger Money by UK, 1979. 
But there is the front. There is the back. Pull this out. Lyrics and credits. More lyrics and credits. Polydor Records. There's the label and the disc. And just catalog numbers on the run out cruise. Now, UK um, British prog rock supergroup. Uh, I say British. We had Terry Bozio with them for this album. American ex Frank Zappa. <coughs> but, um, you know, formed around the triumvirate of uh, Eddie Jobson, former curved air violinist, and uh, John Wetton, former everybody bass player. Um, yeah, I've mentioned it before. You couldn't be in a prog rock band or anything remotely heavy rock in Britain throughout the 70s or 80s without having John Wetton playing on at least one of your albums. Um, it was a law, you know. Prog Rock Act of 1978. But anyway, um, you know, one of uh, one of Jones Callahan's more bizarre laws, but never mind. Um, and this is pretty good. I mean, I've got all the um, UK albums. There's only, well, there's only three of them. There's uh, two studio albums and this. And I've got to admit, this one is my favourite. Now, there was a... I did have a guitarist with them, whose name escapes me. But um, he had departed by this time, cutting them back to a three-piece. And although John Wetton does do some guitar on the album, most of it is done... You know, all the lead work and that is done by Eddie Jobson on violin or keyboards. And it gives it a kind of... I don't know, makes it a little bit more prog rock than you know, it should be. Um, you know, you've got three guys here. It's not earth shattering, but you've got three guys here that are you know, damn fine musicians on top of their game, producing some really sweet music. Highlight on here has to be Carrying No Cross, 12 and a half minutes of, well, it's just brilliance, put it that way. Um, and then you've also got a Rendezvous uh, 602. Um, you know, the opening cut, Danger Money. All the tracks on here are sort of like, with uh, one exception of the single Nothing to Lose, all the tracks on here are pretty epic length and really sweetly played. Um, sadly, UK fell apart after this. John Wetton joined up with some former Yes members to form the Great Asia. Um, Eddie Jobson went back to the reformation of Curve there. Terry Bozio went on to whatever every Terry Bozio does. The guy's always in demand. And um, that was the end of the UK. I think there's been one off reformation, but with the death of John Wetton a couple of years ago, that's not going to happen anymore. But um, overall, just a good album. Um, one of the UK have always been one of the lesser known UK prog bands, but one that you know, should anyone really care to give them a listen, they may find it very enjoyable. Yeah, UK, Danger Money, 1979, I think it was, or 1980. Good stuff. Okay, next up, we're not saying a bit folky, but still a bit punk as well. Here we are, Polka's Not Dead by the Dreadnoughts. There is the front. There is the back. Pop this open. There's the gatefold and the moon behind the disc. There is the disc. And slide this out. Here's the booklet. Um, there's the 
lyrics and that. Now, the Dreadnoughts are a band that I've had several personal interactions with that have normally ended up with me with screaming hangovers and, you know, kind of saying, where's the truck that hit me? Basically, these guys come from Vancouver in Canada. They are a, a folk polka punk band, a sea shanty band that kind of make the pogues look like, you know, the residents of your local convent. These guys are an incredible band, incredible drinkers, incredible party guys, and really nice blokes. Came across them first of all on their first visit to the UK when my band Alien stashed him, supported them, and you know we kept in touch. And most, I can't say every time they come to Bristol, because they come to Bristol every time they come to the UK. But most of the times I've gone down there and joined up with them. They go, hey, the beardy bloke with the aliens, man, and we go and start drinking cider. Um, I've seen these guys live three or four times. I've seen them crawl, literally crawl on stage, so drunk they could hardly stand, and then pick up their instruments and do a storming set, and then stagger off stage and into a drunken heap at the side of it. But, you know, I'm not condoning heavy drinking because it's bad for the liver, but, you know, um, it's part of what the Dreadnoughts do. This is their third album. Um, it's a little bit more um, kind of instrumental dancey than their first two. The first two was like a selection of folk songs. This one, you've got uh, lots of stuff that's kind of very much kind of folky reels, sort of shanty sing-alongs kind of thing. Interestingly, it contains a cut called Turbo Island, which is a cover of their mate's... Um, Bristol band, The Surfing Turnips. I talked about The Surfing Turnips, uh, Turbo Island album, a good few episodes ago on here. Well, the Dreadnoughts have covered it, and, um, you know, and every time the Dreadnoughts saw the Britain, The Surfing Turnips are on the bill with them because they're drinking buddies. Uh, this is just, it's just kind of an intense, great rock, great folky punk album. It just comes out your Black Sea Gale, uh, West Country Man, Sleep is for the Week, something in Polish that I can't pronounce. Um, no, that's not the same title, but there's that one there if you do want to. Any Polish speakers out there can pronounce that. Please let me know, let me know what it means. But anyway, um, great album. I love the Dreadnoughts. Uh, I've got about six, seven albums out now. I have most of them. And, uh, you know, I'm not going to recommend where to start with the Dreadnoughts. All I'll turn around and say is, if you want to hear the Pogues Plus, if you want to hear some of the greatest kind of folk punk ever, pick a Dreadnoughts album at random and pass straight in. This is as good a place to start as any, but they're all pretty shit hot. Yeah, Dreadnoughts, Polka's Not Dead, and uh, I think this is 2015, but I may be wrong. Great stuff. Okay, next up, complete change of gear. We'll have this. This is Native Sons by a Scottish band Strange Ways. There is the front. And I think this is 1988. I'll have a look. 87 maybe. There's the back. 1987. Slide this out. Big logo. Lyrics. Again, pull this out. There's a. I don't know what Bonaire labels are. It's not a label I've come across before, other than I've got a couple of Strange Ways albums that are on it. Um, oh, 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 we have. We do have a run out groove message, but oh no, it's, it's just a 
shallow press catalog number. Ah, but anyway, um, strange ways. This lot came out of Glasgow early 1980s, higher than you over British heavy metal. However, strange ways didn't want to sound like Maiden. They didn't want to sound like Venom or anyone like Def Leppard or anything like that. No, I know, Strange Ways were heavily into bands like Foreigner and Journey and Toto. <clears throat> so they became Scotland's leading AOR band. Stadium Rock, think Journey, think Toto, you're in that kind of vein. And they were okay at it. Um... I don't know what it is, but, you know, there's been quite a few British bands, excuse me. Been quite a few British bands over the years that have attempted to kind of reproduce that big, slick American stadium rock sound. I think the bands like FM, Vega, etc., 10, etc. But, you know, to me, a British band doing that kind of music, it doesn't quite work. I mean, you know, I always believe that if you're going to write a convincing song about something, you need to have lived it. And uh, trying to write songs about, um, uh, you know, cruising Sunset Boulevard in the murk, when all you know is kind of the back streets of Glasgow, ain't going to sound right. Thus, also, trying to do a song about the back streets of Glasgow in a style lending itself to you know, again, doesn't quite, to me, work. And I'll, that's always been my problem with Strange Ways. They're a good band. They are very good. The musicianship on this is first rate. Um, the album is uh, uh, John Punter produced, which is um, excellent, produced over at Powerplay Studios in Switzerland, which is a great studio. Um, line up on this, you've got Terry Brock on vocals, Jim Drummond on drums, David Stewart on bass, and Ian Stewart, who are brothers, I think, on lead guitar. Um, it's slick, it's great, it, yeah, musically it's fine, but I don't know. You've got cuts like Goodnight LA, Empty Streets, it's a mixture of kind of sort of like big anthems and power ballads, etc. But I don't know, I was giving this album a listen a couple of times during this week, preparing for this week. Um, I do like it musically, but it just doesn't speak to me. Um, yeah, I mean, maybe if you're into kind of Journey or... Yeah, because I'm not a big Journey fan. I do like Toto, yeah, I'll give them a, a listen. Um, but if you're into bands like FM, um, Journey, you know, the 80s foreigner stuff, then maybe you'll find this to your liking. But to me, although I can respect it as a well-played, well-produced, well-written, well-performed album, um, it just doesn't speak. So, uh, you know, I salute them, but, you know, you're not going to be on my hi-fi on my radio shows that often. Although, having said that, I will give um, I will give a couple of tracks off this a spin, probably on The Rock Druid. And, uh, you know, just see what you guys think. Anyway, talking about that, before I press on, um, I apologise, oh, I've said this every, so, every few episodes, I can't do needle drops, I can't do sort of like bits playing in the background. I tried it, got a copyright strike, and uh, I don't want to risk losing my channel, I had fun doing this. So, uh, you know, but most of these bands you can Google, there's going to be samples on the net somewhere you can find, and uh, or download or whatever. And uh, I do try and play some of the stuff off here on the radio shows. So um, I'll say I'm going to do Strange Ways over the next couple of weeks. I'm opening up the couple of tracks from the Jam album on BCFM on Sunday. And uh, there's some Ramesses on, this, on the current edition of The Rock Druid. So uh, check them out if you want to hear some of that. Okay, pressing straight on, we'll have a bit of this. Um, we've been a bit light on the old metal side this week. So uh, I thought I'd make it up with this one. This is a deification by Not Above Evil. Ah, there's the front. There's the back. Open this up. 
that is what lays behind the disc. There is the disc. I'll show you the press release in a minute. Here's the booklet. What's well, a booklet? It's a uh, just a fold out. There's the front. There's the back. 2010. This this came out. this out fresh release bad photo there <coughs> right now not above evil they were um, came out of uh, Manchester Formed around a bloke called Sadiq Mohammed um, from the uh, yeah from Manchester there with a couple of mates. Um, did an EP 2009. Well, not long after the band formed. This is their debut album. They've done a couple of albums since this, and these guys are metal with a capital M. Mm, double raised horns. These guys are more metal than a big pile of rusty girders. Um, they draw in lots of influences. Um, this album contains there's hints of kind of, you know, sort of like Bay Area thrash, you know, Flotsam and Jetsam sort of stuff. Also kind of hints of German bands like Sodom and that floating around in here. Um, groove metal tinges like Lamb of God, etc., as well as kind of big doses of traditional black and death. You know, you're talking about you know, hints of Bathory, um, uh, Vader, uh, Baphomet, all those kind of bands. Um, the result is a very intelligent, uh, well, it is intelligent, but it's a very intense, heavy, heavy listen. This will melt your, this can melt, ear, this album can melt eardrums at 300 paces. And it's very, very good. I do like this. I do like Not Above Evil as a band. I have several of their albums now. Band is still very much an ongoing concern. Um, <clears throat> so again, look out for them after lockdown. Um, but, you know, on here, just having a look at... I, ha I have played this album through for the first time in a couple of years uh, this morning. And um, I'm just looking back and... I'll, you know, just looking at the, the, the some of the song titles, or Seven Broken Halos, and... Uh, uh, what is it? Yeah, the child of lead, etc. Just puts a smile on my face. Um, yeah, it's just a really good album by a really good band. Um, yeah, these the, the, uh, these guys aren't going to be the latest, uh, you know, ever going to be metal gods. Um, you know, yeah. If you're gonna, if you do see them at festivals, it's gonna be on one of the side stages at Bloodstock or Beermageddon or something like that. But you know, these guys have already carved a little le cult legacy for themselves with a string of great albums that I hope will continue for a long time, because these guys have a lot of talent, and uh, as long as they keep banging out records like this, then. They deserve all the all the cult sensations they can get. So yeah, um, the sun and shadow, the closing. Every time I look at the back of this album, come and think, oh, great song, great song, because it is. Yeah, not above evil. Deification, two thousand and ten, absolutely storming, and uh, recommended for anyone that likes it. Heavy, and. Uh, yeah, that's it. Metal heads of the world unite and buy a copy of this album. Already, if not above evil stuff, it's all pretty sweet. Okay, leads us on to the last one. And this might come as a bit of a shock to some people. 
considering I have been on previous episodes of this quite down on yes. And I bet you're going to go, oh, he's got to slag it off. Here we are, close to the edge, 1972. There is the front. There is the back. Open this up for the Roger Dean gatefold. Yeah, two Roger Dean appearances on the same on the same episode. Well done, Roger. Yeah. Pull this out. Lyrics. And Atlantic Records, of course. And once more, just catalogue numbers on the run out cruise. Now, yes, I can be very down on yes. Yes, I do. Yes, yes. <laughs> yeah, I do find that a lot of this band's stuff is very pompous, very much up his own backside. Um, John Anderson's vocals do annoy me. A fair bit, but actually quite a bit. Um, you know, it's not so much that he sings in a higher pitch, it's just that it's high pitch with no real power there. And, um, you know, because you know, people like Rob Alper could get get up that high, but may have gut. John Anderson sounds like a asthmatic schoolboy when he gets to the top there. Yeah, but anyway, um, that's just my personal taste. But Having said that, there are some points of Yes's career that I do really like. This album being one of them. Um, overall, there's only think there's three tracks on this record, isn't there? Yeah, only three tracks on the entire album. The first side is the title cut, Close to the Edge. 20-odd minutes of um, excessive whittling, but um, quite, a, quite a song. And for once, it's a track that John Anderson's lyrics aren't um, uh, particularly kind of that much away with the fairies. Um, you know, he wants to retain his mass, apparently, in some points. And seasons pass him by, but yeah. Yes, on the other side, you've got... Uh, as you and I, which is again probably the weakest point on the album, but still quite sweet as far as yes go. And then uh, Siberian Cathu, which is um, again John Anderson's vocals on that, I think, were a little bit what the fuck, but you know, it does it okay. Yes, on this album, uh, this is the classic lineup, of course, John Anderson vocals, Bill Bruford percussion, Steve Howe guitar, Chris Squire bass. Old Ricky Wakeman on the uh, keyboards, and um, they managed to keep it kind of a little bit together on this. You know, um, yes, it can be very self indulgent, but you know, believe me, yes, to get a lot more self indulgent on this. <coughs> Thousand topographic oceans, for example. But you know, they managed to keep keep this on the just about on the right side of listenable. And uh, just about to avoid disappearing up their own backside musically. Um, this is one of the few Yes albums I can play regularly without getting bored of. So, um, yeah, considering I'm not a big Yes fan, that's high praise for me. <coughs> Probably the best they're going to get. Um, Eddie Orford's production's great. Maybe that's what's reining them in. I don't know. And of course, you've got that. I'll show it again. Not quite Rodney Matthews, I know, but Roger Dean runs a guy close second, in my opinion. There's the Rodney Matthews art, uh, Roger Dean artwork. So, yeah. 1972, yes, close to the edge. Not bad for a yes album. So, that's it for this week. Um, yeah, feel free to kind of uh, like and subscribe and share and that kind of thing. It all helps boost the algorithm. And uh, if you want to make a comment, please feel free. I'm always up to debate. Now, have you ever come across that Ramesses album? 
What's your opinion of it? Um, am I wrong with Yes? What other Yes albums should I give a listen to? Bearing in mind, I have got most of them and have listened to most of them, but what one should I revisit and uh, try not to chew my own, own ears off with? Strange Ways. Did they work? I say no. Maybe you've got a slightly different opinion. But uh, it's always good to hear from you. And uh, how metal are not above evil? Yeah, these questions and more, you can ask and answer in the section. So, yeah, remember, links down there to the radio shows on YouTube. They're going to be over there on Facebook. And until next week, peeps, um, keep rocking and rolling. And I'm out of here. Love, cheers. Bye. <laughs>